Uh, welcome everyone to our first webinar of 2022. We're almost halfway through the year, but um, I'm just going to do I have a couple quick announcements um, to get started. And you know, we have the rest of the time for Virginia to present. Very interested in the topic. Um, I would ask, you know, we try to leave as much time for Q and A, uh, and that way, you know, whatever questions you have, you can speak to her. Um, All right. So again, about cure VCP disease for those of you unfamiliar, I think everybody is, you know. We're just working on, and again, we've had a little bit of a change in terms of the mission, which is, you know, VCP associated multi-system proteinopathy. Hopefully you've seen from a lot of the papers, you know, we call it VCP disease, IBM PFD, but really the official name that a lot of the scientists want to call is VCP associated multi-system proteinopathy. And so um, what I've highlighted at the bottom here is a couple of the publications um, that we've collaborated and worked with, you know, Virginia and others on. Um, and, and certainly our goal is to eradicate, you know, this disease and we appreciate everybody, um, you know, your participation in helping us do that. I did Armel's on the phone uh, or on the call and I just wanted to welcome her officially um, with the audience here, but, um, you know, tickled that, you know, people, she's, she's gotten after it already. I mean, just some, you know, it's been wonderful. So just great support and uh, Armel, welcome, you know. Uh, to everybody that you know that's on the call. So I just wanted to remind everybody about the natural history studies. So we are closing um, you know those studies. So if you are interested in participating, um, you know, in the nationwide study, you know, it's kind of the last call. And we do have remote only options. You don't have to go to Columbus, Ohio. A lot of folks have already started to finish up their 12 month you know measures. And so certainly the sooner that we can kind of collect all that data, the sooner that things can be published. Um, and then also we have the Casimir study, which I have, a you know, that's a video only study. You can do that on your own time at home. Um, and so if you're interested in that, please feel free to reach out to us about that. But the more, the better, you know, and, you know, the one thing I want to, you know, state to everybody is having these measures and information certainly could be helpful in future clinical trials, especially if a patient's going to be their own control. You know, you having this data, you know, could be valuable. So um, just, you know, we'd love for everybody to participate. And, you know, we're funding these studies and that participation is welcome. And thank you for those of you that are participating. Um, just want to remind everybody about the upcoming, you know, uh, patient and care partner conference. Um, you know, the uh, which is July 22nd, 23rd, we do have a hotel registration deadline. That's when the rooms that are reserved for our group, you know, will expire and we have accessible rooms. We have all the accessible rooms in the hotel. So, you know, we definitely want to encourage you to uh, come to the conference. We have a big agenda planned. Uh, we have 25 plus registered so far, but room for many, many more. And so thank you to the planning team, you know, that's been working hard at that. Uh, they've been meeting every week, everybody, to, you know, to work on that. So right, we have a chat. Um, in terms of the Zoom option, we're, we're working on that, but we certainly want to encourage attendance first, but there'll be more details about that. So if you can come in person, we you know, we've got some financial commitments, you know, made, to, you know, for the venues and stuff. And so certainly the more that can participate in person, the better. Okay, I did want to just make a quick, you know, everybody, if you're not on your phone, you want to scan that code real quick, we have a toolbox that if you can't find all these links to the patient conference and to the standard of care publication and the annual report and all stripes and our nationwide study flyer and our find a doctor tool that we just put out there. You can go to this toolbox and it has all those links on it. And so in the email, the newsletter email, there's a link to it, but you can also scan this QR code and it'll take you right to it and you can bookmark it. Um, but we'll continually update this toolbox with those frequent links, you know, just to help you, um, you know, cause I know there's a lot of information out there. So, uh, but we'll put, you know, we're just, putting this out there to, to help everybody be able to find things quickly and not have to find a, an old email. So, all right. And then last thing, upcoming 2022 events. So we do have a webinar next month with uh, Manisha Korb, Dr. Manisha Korb, who 
you know, was the lead project lead on the standard of care. And so she's going to present on that because she's not able to attend um, the conference. So uh, mark your calendars for June 28th, Tuesday, June 28th at 8 Eastern time. And then we have the happy hours, as we mentioned in the newsletter today, um, there's just going to be one a month. And so the next one's next week, Wednesday, May 18th, and then we'll have one in June and one in July, right before the conference. Okay, so let's get to our speakers. So I don't think Dr. Kimonis needs any introductions. I think, you know, most everybody on the call knows her. Uh, we do want to welcome Maddie, um, who's a candidate undergrad uh, for BS of Biological Sciences at UC Irvine, and I know has been working a lot with um, Virginia on the study. And uh, just want to welcome both of them. And I'm going to stop sharing. Excellent. So Virginia. thank you, Nathan. And thank you to CureVCP for giving us the opportunity to present our, uh, our data. And thank you for all the participants without whom we would not have any data to share. Um, so the, the title of today's talk is Exercise Studies in Hereditary Myopathies. Oops, where is it? And um, I'm going to start with um, not VCP, but the Pompeii study. And the reason I'm doing this is because the original um, grant that was written, that was submitted to the NIH was actually doing this very same study in VCP patients. But unfortunately that did not get funded. We submitted uh, another round. I think the time is ripe now after doing the studies in Pompeii and what I'm going to share you that I did with Maddie. Um, that you know, we should be submitting a proposal to the NIH now to do a VCP uh, work. Um, unfortunately, there is currently no treatment for VCP, so there's no drug company making millions of dollars, and so um, you know there are no funders for this study. But um, Pompe disease has such a, a, a funder, um, uh, and Sanofi Genzyme, um, you know, produces enzyme for Pompe disease. And, and they funded this as a pilot study. And the results were so spectacular that that actually led to a study that my colleague Harrison Jones is doing in Pompeii disease remotely. And then we just finished a pilot in uh, VCP patients that we're hoping will become standard of care once we, we go that next step um, in terms of doing a, a bigger study that um, uh, indicates that there is a need. So um, this was the um, uh, AIM-1, which was to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of supervised resistance training on muscle strength, functional capacity, and body composition. So, um, uh, and then the AIM-2 was to look at the effectiveness of resistance respiratory training on lung function and late onset Pompeii disease. And the primary endpoints were um, looking at muscle strength measurements. Um, we, we were looking at the Biodex dynamometer data because that's a uh, it, it's a less subjective. It's a great big machine that you know some of you have participated in when you came to um, UC Irvine. And then the primary endpoint for the respiratory study was the MIP percentage change, and then. Um, everything else was either secondary or exploratory um, endpoints. <clears throat> These were our 10 patients with Pompe disease, um, you know, uh, just showing their demographics, mutations, what they were doing in terms of six minute walk test and their maximum inspiratory pressure, which are these columns here on the right. And then this was, um, so we have an ongoing natural history study. So I do a, a, a clinic several times a year with uh, Tassin Mozafa, who's a neuromuscular um, neurologist at UC Irvine. And the patients come every six months to every year. And so we gathered a fair amount of data over many years um, uh, in, on their six minute walk test, the force vital capacity and the maximum inspiratory pressure. And then this was the schematic of the, the study. So patients came at baseline and we did all the tests. We consented them, of course, get all the medical history. And then they came at um, one, two, three, four more times. And then we collected, so every two months we collected all this data. So this was um, blood urine collections, mainly for safety, um, pulmonary function studies, six minute walk tests, strength measurements um, uh, with a handheld dynamometer, but also with the Biodex uh, machine that I mentioned. And then, yeah, the DEXA looked at their body composition um, before and after. 
Um, and actually, we also did MRI, which I, I didn't put in here because we didn't include that data for the manuscript because it's still um, being worked out, but we actually saw differences in the MRI as well. So, so these are the results. Um, I have detailed text. I don't know what, what happened to it, but that's your baseline. So we had uh, two measurements as um, baseline, and then we used the second measurement as a more stringent baseline. And then from that, we compared um, you know, what, what happened. So I know that it looks like they improved with the baseline. And I, maybe it's just the fact that uh, people, people were now used to doing the six minute walk test. So uh, we see improvement, but there was no exercise done between visit one and two. And then this was the maximum inspiratory pressure, really quite dramatic improvement. And then we were not exercising the expiratory pressure. These were just exploratory outcomes. And we, we didn't uh, see significant, dif um, significant differences, um, uh, nor did we see significant differences in the force battle capacity, which is not considered a very sensitive measure for pulmonary function. And then this was looking at the um, uh, dynamometry using the biodex and also handheld measures. So um, the main exercise was elbow flexion and knee extension. So those were the two, um, para the, the two areas that we were particularly focusing on, but we actually found that there was improvement in, in the elbow extension as well and the knee extension, uh, sorry, the knee flexion, although the knee extension was the actual exercise. So the elbow flexion and the knee extension, those were the main exercises, but we saw improvements as you can see uh, in both. Um, and then these were with another um, a dynamometer called a microfet, which we use in clinic, um, and we saw yeah. improvement in, in um, many of the measurements, uh, even though they were not being exercised. And then this was looking at the table of all of those measurements, and uh, generally a P of less or, or equal to 0.05 is considered statistically significant, which means that there is less than a one in a uh, thousand chance of this being, um, you know, just by, by chance, uh, sorry, less than a hundred chance. Um, so um, yeah, so it's just the same things again, showing the biodex, um, the six minute walk test didn't change, the knee extensors changed, um, the elbow flexors actually, occurred, oh, oh yeah, so with the biodex, yeah, there were significant differences, the microfet, not so with that. So, so that's a summary of those uh, results that we got with the Pompeii exercise study. There was improvement. Um, I said there was improvement in the six minute walk test, although it wasn't um, statistically different from the baseline. When you compared that with the natural history, there was a significant difference because the decline is what you see in the natural history and then significant improvements in the uh, the MIP, um, the MEP um, in in, uh, um, uh, in, in uh, some patients, um, and there were no adverse events really, other than one patient had a fall and developed back pain. Um, but when we explored why that was, um, he had actually been exercising every single day, and overdid it, and and um, he, his back pain got better um, after he stopped doing that. So now I would, so the results of this study led to us doing this respiratory study. And the motivation for this was COVID because I was really concerned about the health of individuals with VCP disease during COVID. And um, I wanted to give them the best chance by, by doing an exercise study uh, to build up the, the uh, lung function, the maximum inspiratory pressure. So Maddie, do you want to take over at this stage? Uh, yeah, you can keep sharing your screen. Um, Share my screen, you just tell me next, okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, so um, this is a study that we actually just finished <laughs> about a month ago or two months ago, I guess. Um, and it will has, actually has some pretty cool results. So we'll get to those in just a minute, but first we'll talk a little bit about the background of the study. Um, so if you want to hit the next slide. Um, so, as you guys know, VCP disease um, and other multisystem proteinopathies have no cures. Um, there's only really symptomatic treatments that are, uh, you know, aimed at improving the quality of life. Um, and those things include physical therapy, occupational therapy, and um, different mechanical and respiratory aids when those are needed. Um, so, with this study, we hypothesized that 
uh, remotely administered respiratory resistance training is going to help prevent the loss of diaphragmatic and intercostal respiratory muscles, um, as well as their function. And we used the maximum inspiratory pressure to measure this. Um, we we found that this was kind of like the most um, or the best measure of respiratory function. So that's what we decided to use. Um, and then we also thought that by slowly increasing the pressure on the respiratory training devices being used, that the MIPS, the maximum inspiratory pressures, uh, will slowly improve over time uh, for the people affected by these familial myopathies um, in order to kind of increase the strength of those, the, the, those respiratory muscles. Um, and we also aim to help improve the quality of life um, as well as lifespans in defense against diseases such as COVID. Um, so here's a little bit more background for the study. Um, this graph shows um, some data for patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So this is not VCP disease, uh, but it shows a correlation between a uh, uh, decrease in forced vital capacity and uh, a the age at loss of ambulation. And so overall, I think the most important thing to note from this graph is that once your, VC, your FVC is less than one liter, your uh, uh, risk of death is significantly increased. Um, so that's definitely not something that you want. And again, something that we're trying to um, combat with this study. Um, so this slide shows, this one's back into VCP patients. So this shows a decline with age in the uh, forced vital capacity of 28 different people with VCP disease. Um, you can see that there's a pretty significant decline as they uh, get older. Um, and then the next one is probably uh, really significant for the study too. This shows the maximum inspiratory pressure as well as the maximum expiratory pressure of a spe one specific patient um, who has VCP disease. You can see there's a pretty significant or decline over um, his lifespan. And you can see that uh, there is a that red value right there, those red dots, that is the inspiratory pressure. Um, and so that's kind of what we were targeting during the study. Uh, um, so our specific aims of this study, um, one was to evaluate the effectiveness of the respiratory muscle exercise training on lung function of quality of life and of muscle strength. Uh, we also aimed to successfully conduct a remote study to increase access to potentially beneficial treatments, which is honestly one of the most important outcomes of this study, um, to just because access is becoming a lot more difficult, especially with the pandemic and um, limited mobility. Um, and then our third aim is to incorporate inspiratory exercise treatment as a standard of care if significance is observed. Um, so now we'll move on to kind of the methods of the study and how this was conducted. So every two weeks, we sent out a couple of surveys. We had the inclusion by body myopathy functional rating scale and the amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis functional rating scale. And those were kind of used just to see um, how different aspects of day-to-day -day life are uh, affected by the progression of the disease. Um, and then once we started the exercise phase, we also had the Borg skill, which was there just to kind of assess any perceived effort following inspiratory exercises and just serve as a guide to make sure that there was no harm being done. Uh, we also had handheld dynamometers. This is how we measured grip strength. So um, every two weeks, the left and right grip strength would be measured. Um, and overall, we kind of just measured that over the course of the whole 40 week study. And as for our respiratory measurements, we took spirometry data as well as the maximum inspiratory uh, pressures. So we used the pro device, that little gray device on the right, uh, to measure the maximum inspiratory pressures. And then we used the MIR Spiro, SpiroBank Smart um, to use the, uh, to measure the spirometry. And these devices were cool because they're small handheld and relatively cheap. Uh, in the wide scheme of things. Uh, and so this kind of fits in with the theme of Im uh, in, in improving uh, access to different treatments. Um, these also both connect to your phone. So as long as you have a smartphone, you can download an app and that's kind of how we track the different measurements. Um, and I think it was honestly really effective. So, and then this is kind of just different pictures of the different inspiratory training devices we had. There were three of them, um, just basically just how... Um, depending where you're at in terms of your maximum inspiratory pressure. Um, the one on the left is the one, it goes up to about uh, 41. Uh, the second one goes up to about 75. And then the last one goes up to about 150. Um, overall, there is a little bit difference in difficulty between them just because the pressures are increasing as you go up to the bigger sizes. 
Um, but this is the devices that were used to do the respiratory training. So this is kind of just a brief overall view of the methodology and how we conducted the study. So you can see that there's some measurements that we conducted every two weeks, and then there's some that we conducted every four weeks. Um, so every two weeks, we look at the maximum inspiratory pressures, um, spirometry values, the dynamometry, the two surveys that I mentioned earlier, and then starting week eight, also the Borg scale. Um, and then every four weeks, uh, that's when we met with the patients over Zoom. Um, that's when we measured the six minute walk test and the timed up and go. Um, and then you can see in the uh, orange and yellow uh, week breakdown, those first eight weeks were our baseline phase. So we were not doing any exercise uh, during those first eight weeks. That was kind of just our short little baseline phase just to see um, over that short period how, what the trends are going to look like with these measurements. Uh, we did have the patients serve as their own baselines. Uh, just because this is a rather small population of people, and uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone who participated in the study was able to get the benefits, if there were some, um, from these training devices. Uh, so starting week eight, that's when we started with the respiratory training. Uh, we set the uh, training devices up to 50% of the maximum inspiratory pressures, um, and then six days per week, twice a day, for 25 breaths, the participants would be using the exercise training device. Um, and then every two months, we increased that percentage by 10%, ending with 80% overall. Um, and that's kind of just a brief rundown of how that study went. So now we'll start getting into the graphs. So this is my favorite part to look at. Um, this is the maximum inspiratory pressure um, compared to the baseline phase. Um, and you can see that there's definitely an increase in both the um, the left graph is just like the raw maximum inspiratory pressure values, whereas the right graph is the percent improvement. So you can see that there is um, definitely an increase on both of those, which is really cool. Um, both of those are actually significant also, which is really fun to see. Um, so you have a, it's about a 0.4 uh, increase on the left graph every week um, for the entire study, which is awesome to see. And then on the right graph for the exercise phase, it's uh, a 0.6 increase. So you can see the slopes are pretty similar. The left, or sorry, the right one is a little bit steeper though. And then um, our spirometry, there were about six different values for this. These are our secondary outcomes. We weren't necessarily expecting anything to change here, but uh, we were hoping that there wouldn't be um, too much uh, difference from like the natural history data we've collected in other um, studies before. Um, so I know these graphs are really small. Um, there wasn't a ton of significance here. Um, there was, I think, a slight decrease um, on some of the uh, later on values. I'm still working on um, some of the data analysis for this now that we have the access to the full 40 weeks of data. Um, but you can see overall, like the slopes are pretty uh, straight, pretty close to zero. There's not really any significant decreases, and there's definitely not any significant increases. Okay, and then this was one of our exploratory outcomes. So we have our six minute walk test here. Um, again, very, very similar to the maximum inspiratory pressure. On the left hand side, you have the total distance that they went, just kind of the raw numbers of that. And then on the right hand side, that is the percent improvement. Um, so you can see in the baseline phase, there is a pretty sharp increase in both, excuse me, the total distance and the percent improvement. We think that's largely just because um, our participants were still, um, you know, figuring out how to do the six minute walk test, you know, adjusting to uh, whatever setup they had in their home and figuring out just like which, you know, strategy worked best for them. Um, so there is a pretty significant increase in the baseline phases for both of those. Um, but there is also a slight increase in the percent improvement for the six minute walk test. Um, unfortunately, it's not statistically significant, but we weren't really expecting to see uh, a change with the six minute walk test. This was just a measurement that we uh, were collecting um, as a just in case type of measure. And it also serves as really good natural history data. Um, this one is our timed up and go. Um, there was no significant changes here, but you do see um, a deep. OK, so explaining this one a little bit more on the left hand side, you do see uh, that's a total time. We want that to be decreasing. I know decreasing is oftentimes bad, but the timed up and go uh, a lower time means a faster time. 
Um, so when it's decreasing, that means their times are improving because they're getting shorter. Um, so it is good to see a decrease on both of those. Unfortunately, they're not statistically significant in, uh, decreases. Uh, but again, we weren't expecting them to. This was another exploratory outcome. Um, you do see on the right graph increases. That's because when we were doing the data analysis for this one, we set it up so that a positive slope means a improvement, which is still a decrease in time. Um, but it just looks a little bit nicer when you're looking at graphs to see a positive meaning a good thing. Um, so it does show um, a positive percent improvement. It just, again, was not statistically significant. Um, but again, we were not expecting that. So. Maddie, just to be sure, just so I understand this as well. So on the left, mm -hmm. the actual raw data, where oh, we're, we're seeing that there's a decrease, which is a good thing, right? Um, with the exercise phase, and this is just looking at the improvement. So it's really the same thing, but just the graphs looking in different directions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then this one shows the dynamometry, which was another um, exploratory measure that we were looking at. We weren't really expecting any improvement for the dynamometry. This is just the grip strength with the handheld dynamometers. Um, I think there were some statistically significant decreases on the left-hand grip strength. Um, that's not concerning, though, just because a decrease in grip strength is uh, normal with the progression of these diseases. Um, so it's not concerning, and it is a very, very slight decrease over the course of the study. I believe the numbers were like a 0.1 pound per week. Um, over the entire course of the study. So again, very small and not concerning. And that's the left hand and right hand. Uh, and, and probably for the paper, Patty, you'll do an average um, as well. Yeah. All right, so overall for our conclusions for this paper, uh, we did find that the effectiveness of administering this treatment uh, makes or remotely specifically makes it accessible to many individuals who can't travel due to expenses, mobility, life responsibilities, or imposed restrictions. Uh, we also were able to use really small and cheap portable devices, uh, which makes the respiratory exercise more accessible and realistic to individuals with the neuromuscular diseases such as VCP disease, HSPB8, and other familial myopathies. Um, we do, or we do expect an overall decline with these measurements as a part of the natural disease progression um, and com comparing it to some of our natural history data from other studies. Uh, we did see a significant increase in the maximum inspiratory pressure, um, which was the primary outcome, and that does demonstrate that respiratory exercise was beneficial to the individuals with familial myopathies. Uh, we overall did not expect to see improvements in the sec or did not expect to see improvements in the secondary outcomes. Um, and this second last bullet point is a little bit outdated because uh, we did have a little bit different data interpretations when we were looking at a smaller subset of the data. Um, but with the full data, we do see uh, non-significant changes with the six-minute walk test. Um, and overall, we conclude that the respiratory training devices should absolutely be included in future standards of care. They did show um, overall positive changes for uh, the majority of our participants. Thank you, Maddie. Um, I actually was going to move on to what we're proposing as a next uh, study, but this might be a good time to pause and see if any questions. See, this is what I'm going to talk about next. Cami, I know you had a question in the chat. Yeah. So, where did you get the um, history from? Sorry, what was the question? In the beginning of the presentation, you talked about the history of BCP uh, patients and so forth like that. And um, where did you get that history? Well, the natural history? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been collecting data since, um, since the beginning, right? Since uh, 1996, I think. Um, yeah, I've been seeing patients with VCP. And initially I was actually pretty organized and I was sending out surveys, which some of you may have received where I was in the mail sending out the um, IBM FRS, uh, for instance, and then collecting it. And then people were also submitting it online into REDCap. 
so I have a lot of I have a lot of data, and actually um, we're in the process right now, finally, because uh, I had to pull it from different sources. Uh, we had it in the patient's binders. You know, we have now 110 families with BCP disease. Um, so just pulling it all, um, putting it into red cap, cleaning everything, like the mutation, etc. Uh, so yeah, we're we're seeing pretty striking yeah changes um, in the quality of life. Um, we haven't looked at all of the other um, data as yet. We're just beginning right now. Yeah. Was, Thank was, you. Is that the question? I'm sorry uh, if I didn't answer you. Okay. Liz. Hi, Maddie. Thank you for your presentation. Great job. Um, Quick question, and I apologize if I missed this, but how compromised were these patients to begin with? So Ma Maddie, um, maybe I, I should, um, so we um, actually uh, just remembered that we didn't uh, show you the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the inclusion criteria, they, they had to have VCP disease. Um, um, they had to have muscle weakness. Um, they had to be able to walk, you know, with a walker was okay. So, you know, if they were uh, in a wheelchair, of course, you know, it was, it was difficult to do those measures um, just because we want to see if this, um, you know, study improves um, um, other, other parameters. Um, so, yeah, if they had, you know, uh, we didn't actually turn anybody away. So everybody who wanted to participate was invited. I think there may have been um, one person, yeah, who was in a different country that our VCP um, study didn't extend to because our IRB um, is a little strict. Um, you have to go through many hoops to get international patients. Was it a, a varied population or were they pretty similar? I would say there was a varied population, uh, but actually, you know, uh, the there were there were surprises, you know, in terms of the results. You know, there, are, yeah, like a couple of patients uh, did continue to decline, and we're still we haven't analyzed all the data. Uh, to me, um, Maddie, I mean, chip in if if um, you've already done the analysis, but. You know, I, I think you had to have a, a certain uh, threshold to benefit from this. If you didn't, you didn't always benefit from the exercise. But again, um, I ha we haven't done all the analysis. We actually met again with a statistician today to figure out, you know, the analysis. Um, I'm not a statistician, and <laughs> um, so you know, we we need we need help with that. Um, but there there will be more information and. Clearly, this is a really small study, you know, with nine VCP patients, and we had two patients with HSPB8, um, just because, you know, we're actively um, working with, with that disease as well. Um, but um, what I would like to do next is I've already sort of superficially shared the results with Dr. Mozafa and um, planning to put in a bigger study, of, you know, bigger um, this is a pilot that will hopefully lead to a bigger study, which will then become standard of care. That that's the plan. Um, you know, not sure how easy it's going to get be to get funded, but now we have preliminary data. Hope, hopefully, it will. <clears throat> you know, if this was our first time when we first submitted it, we had no information of how the patients would 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 do because you know many patients many patients are under the impression that exercise is bad for you and they have stopped exercising but clearly that is wrong you know obviously overdoing exercise is bad but exercising in a controlled way um, especially with this respiratory study and then what we did with Pompeii shows that people improve good question though thank you that's been one of my concerns. Um, that's been one of my concerns that the doctor initially told me that I um, shouldn't overexercise, and yet I am hearing that exercise is good. And when it comes to the breathing, it's absolutely critical that I get this right because that's where I'm struggling the most. So um, how do I know if, for me, um, doing these breathing exercises is a good thing or not? You know, maybe the people to answer will be, um, I don't know, I mean, I don't want to pick on anyone, but if anyone is 
um, is here who is participating in the respiratory study remotely, maybe share your experience, whether you felt you were improved or... or... Um, I, I have a comment for Virginia. Um, Virginia, I think I would recommend you seeing a pulmonologist or make sure that you see somebody that can help make sure that you are breathing correctly with this. I did participate in this study and I'm an asthmatic and I breathe with my shoulders. Um, and I see that you are as well because you're just trying to find room in your chest for your lungs to breathe. So I guess for me doing some of these exercises where I was laying on my back so that my, my uh, muscles were actually being strengthened and I wasn't lifting my shoulders, but that would be like a speech therapist that can help you with that or a pulmonologist. That's, I, I just, I guess that would be my two cents. My pulmonologist isn't very helpful. And, I, and you know, just not to belabor it, but I can't even lay down. So if I lay down, I suffocate. So I have a feeling I'm one of those that is kind of past that, that safe mode. Um, for doing this sort of stuff. And, and so, you know, those are questions that hopefully we'll be able to answer in time. But uh, right now we don't have a clear answer. Uh, and, you know, we, we still have to do some more analysis, even with our existing data to figure out who, why do some people benefit and why do some people continue to decline? But, you know, it could be that they, you have to have a certain threshold. So, so Maddie, quick question. So, I know, I mean, the hypothesis would be that if you exercise, you're going to get better. Right? I mean, kind of exercise. Virginia, do you mind muting? I'm getting lots of feedback. Um, if you do any kind of, you know, but are you planning to compare this to more of a non uh, affected population just to see? Because, I mean, so it sounds like with the exercise, people got better or they didn't get worse, but how much better? I mean, how much would you have expected it? Because I know the inspiratory device athletes use that to train, right? I mean, that's what we learned in the beginning, but, you know, what would we normally expect to see versus what we saw? I mean, are you planning on doing that analysis or comparison? It's a really good question. Um, I think for this study, we initially planned on having a control group, but for the study that didn't end up working out, um, this was a pilot study, so uh, we were kind of more focused on just if it was going to be effective at all for the patients with these types of diseases. Um, I think in the future, Dr. Kimonis definitely wants to do this study again uh, with a larger control population of people who don't have the disease or aren't affected by the disease. Um, and I think we also wanted to do things like have a longer baseline period, definitely um, uh, like Kemi was talking about, like pay attention to um, if the patients know how to breathe correctly, just because that is definitely important with this uh, type of study, just because with the respiratory training device, you do have to breathe in pretty hard. And if you're not doing that correctly, you could, um, it could not feel the best on you. So we would definitely want to make sure that we're setting everyone up for success. Um, so I don't think for this paper specifically, we're going to have that data, but we hope to in the future. All right. And secondary question. So frequency is that twice a day i mean it was a pain it was terrible um so would you be testing or experimenting with what frequency might get you the same benefit but not having to do so much well uh, some people wanted to do more than twice a day nathan so <laughs> it's only breathing 20 times you know took five minutes didn't <laughs> but yeah it's just remembering I think remembering um because yeah it was a pain you had to have your device with you um and that's the reason why you know, Maddie mentioned the controls didn't work out so well because I was one of those controls so um yeah it was it was hard to always remember but uh yeah you know but but the more you exercise the more benefit um, I believe you would get so twice twice a day is is something that ha, it has been spectacular. Well, the results have been spectacular with a MIP. But hold on a second. we know that more exercise, too much exercise, could be detrimental. So 
I guess just understanding those thresholds, um, you know, again, because it might have been, you know, twice a day, times a day might have been too much. But that, that was my question was, if you continue to study, are you going to alter frequencies for people just to see, you know, right. it, maybe it doesn't matter. No, I think that's a good, that's a, a good um, uh, consideration that we should probably be looking at different, um, yeah, we just arbitrarily said 25 puffs, puffs um, what is it, like uh, three, three rounds and then twice a day. Um, uh, I don't know if other people found it difficult to carry out the exercise study, maybe you could share. Uh, I'll share what I've learned from mine. Um, and Virginia, you may want to talk to your doctor about this because I also can't lay flat. Um, but I did the manual ones, but I also had low enough uh, pulmonary function tests that I have a um, electric one that I use the same too, twice a day. And it was 20. Um, with that one. So I was doing the 25 with the manual, the 20 with the electric. I just had my pulmonary function tests again and my results went up by 20. So it, it, it does work. I don't know if it's the electric or if I was the manual both, but, um, he was very surprised, you know, cause when I first asked him about doing it, my pulmonologist is like, well, it's not going to hurt um, because my numbers were pretty getting pretty low anyway. Um, so I would say the exercising was definitely beneficial, even though I was so far, you know, and I still can't lay flat, but my breathing is better than it was. That's really, thank you, Lisa, for sharing. That's, that's great. And I'd love to um, get, get further feedback from you. Um, Virginia, I have a question. Um, do you see any commonality between the, the group that responded really well, I mean, better, and the group that did not respond at all? I think there were just two people who didn't respond as well. Um, Maddie, if you, if you have anything, please share. One of them actually was not a VCP patient. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and, you know, we had one, one patient in this group that didn't, didn't respond as well. Um, but I think everybody else actually did, did show a significant response. Um, Maddie, do you, do you have anything to add to that? <clears throat> Um, that is something I'm planning on including in our data analysis. I just haven't gotten quite there yet. Um, we're still in the very early stages and looking through everything right now. Right. But so we, we understand well that uh, some of the patients were not VCT patients. It's a mix of different disease or they're all... We VCT? had nine patients who had VCP disease. Two of them had the HPV uh, familial myopathy. Okay. There were 11 altogether. So nine with VCP and two. Okay. But, but you know, th that, that if, if there was a, yeah, for when we publish the paper, we're not going to include the HSPV8. It's just going to be a VCP uh, paper with the nine as a pilot. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, it'll be interesting to see, you know, whether people who were already good were they the ones to benefit the most? Um, but it's, it's good to hear Lisa's comments. And so that I, I meant in, in terms of variants, I imagine you have the, 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 the sure. genome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think there were several mutations, uh, but you know, with a small pilot, we don't expect to. Yeah, no, it's not yeah, that yeah. big. Yeah, I mean, even when we looked at um, 180 patients, you know, data, we didn't really find too much in the way of genotype, phenotype correlations, just a couple of things. Um, but yeah, thank you. And any, any other comments uh, from anybody else? How was the, um, the training of the patients? Like, so I, I had heard something about some patients having a hard time holding the device and just the way they I know that the way you, your posture makes makes a difference. So is some of the disability get in the way for with, of 
performing it remotely? Yeah, um, so one, uh, so nobody really complained to us about the exercise. There was one patient who, who did have difficulty because of, you know, developing um, chest pain. Um, so, so, you know, uh, that individual had to lay down. Um, so if that person wants to speak up, maybe <laughs> you could do that. Um, but yeah, so, um, but, but nobody else, um, you know, had uh, any issues. We tried to train as best as we could, um, you know, with, with the device. The, uh, uh, the one that was up to 45 was a real easy one to use, but they didn't, it didn't really um, apply to people as they went up uh, with the percentage of their MIP. Uh, and then the, the other devices were a little more challenging because the gr gradations wasn't as helpful. Nathan, do you want to speak about that? Because you were one of the high hitters, you know, in terms of the numbers. What did you think about that device? Um, Which one, the inspiration? Uh, uh, the exercise one, the 150. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought it was, I liked it. it was great. Okay. I didn't like the exercise, oh, the exercise tool. No, I didn't like them. They, um, they make a lot of noise and it's hard to configure and, and kind of set up. Yeah, Surge is showing. Um, that's yeah. the one. It's, it's a spacer, yeah. Yeah, the, the inspiratory electronic device was nice because you knew it, it was working, but the manual device, it was just very hard to configure. So um, we did have another question um, from Amy. I guess her mic's not working. She wanted to know. Is, can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Oh, there it is. Um, I had a question about variants also. Um, so for future studies, do you think you'll focus on one variant or do you think you'll use whatever you can get if you have a, a larger sample size for future studies? Yeah. Well, the thing is that we have got two big papers that we published on genotype phenotype correlations and the, the, diff, the, the two variants that were associated with some differences was the R159H, which seems to be a milder variant. And uh, people don't develop muscle weakness. Uh, they typically don't develop paget. Uh, so muscle weakness appears later. And, you know, so people live longer. So uh, there's more dementia noted um, in that cohort. But, but generally, it, it's a milder variant. Um, initially, we thought that the R155C variant was a little more severe because of early onset and more rapid progression. But when we looked at a bigger cohort, we didn't see any differences. So I'm not expecting with a small pilot, even if I take 20, have 20 people, 30 people, we're not going to see genotype, genotype differences because even within the same family, there is such a huge variability. Um, you know, one person gets Paget. One person gets ALS, one person gets right. as, as you know, it, 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 that would be hard. But we will look at those differences, absolutely, and, and see if, um, you know, certain variants. Um, uh, do you have a special reason for asking that question? Ken? Nope. I was just wondering, you know, with the... Uh, um... The, the you know the most common kind of r155 is or whatever that we most of us have um being kind of what we're studying right now with the natural history study and things like that i didn't know if you were planning on focusing more on that or if you were branching out to other variants so with, with the rare disorder you know we would take whoever we can get okay. right and you know, this, this um, the people with this disorder have been really, really um, very cooperative, very helpful, you know, in advancing knowledge. So we really appreciate the support. That's because we're awesome. You are awesome, absolutely. I agree. Um, no dispute. So are Virginia, there any other questions? There was one more comment from Cami. Just a suggestion might be to focus on breathing and not add all the other measures. It got to be a lot. So. Yeah. so, but, but, you know, that's why the pilot is so valuable, right? Because if you don't do the pilot, then you don't really know what's, what's important, what isn't. Um, so, so yeah, I think moving forward, we would just focus on the respiratory studies, maybe do that six minute walk test or timed up and go, because we did see that there was improvement um, in the six minute walk test. 
um, you know, those, those videos, and then do the quality of life, which uh, Maddie hasn't analyzed those yet, Maddie. That's your next task. Yeah, the IBM FRS and the ALS FRS. So the IBM FRS has been really useful yeah, for the natural history study as well. So, so with the, the six minute walk is one of the measures that I think our patients hate the most because it's the most grueling. Um, would how how much modification and it's also hard to do at home because of the length of the track right. um i know you made some changes how can you tell me like what was the largest track length and what was the smallest track track length that you ended up using maddie you're better equipped to answer that <laughs> um our largest one was the full 10 meters um and then our shortest one was i think three meters Thinking, you know, in the future, maybe the, the timed up and go seemed to be really robust and it took yeah, a few seconds to do. Yeah. And everybody did that, the timed up and go. So we just put that, you know, in front of them uh, and, and then whatever time it took for them to get up from the chair, walk there, turn around and sit back. Yeah. And I would, one time. Sorry, can I? I would suggest okay, just, just doing the timed up and go and scrapping the six minute. Because the six minute is so hard, and especially for anybody who lives in a climate like I do, and then um, it's just very difficult. And so then I'm out in my garage in the winter. It's wet. It's icy, snowy, um, I'm cold. You know, it just I don't know. It gets to be a lot, and then to do it every month. So I think timed up and go since you got good data on that. I'd simplify that you can do it. In your home, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So quality of life, uh, the respiratory parameters and um, yeah, the uh, um, timed up and go would be good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So of course, yeah, we will definitely talk with, with um, the, the patients who participated to get their um, opinion before we put this, this study forward. Hopefully somebody will fund it. But yeah, it's it's hard getting you know things funded like studies funded like this, but it's really important because I think it should be incorporated in standard of care. Like my Pompeii study, you know, it's not standard of care right now. The neuromuscular neurologists are not recommending uh, exercise. It's like a twenty dollar device, and the results are so spectacular compared to a million dollar a year treatment right now. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they're not achieving the same myth that this $20 device is. Uh, so, yeah, more, more to come. Uh, any other questions? And I'll just finish up by sharing the next study we're going to do. I'm just curious, how is the funding for this, this um, study? Where, where does it come from? The one we just shared with you? The pilot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, QRVCP <laughs> paid for the... Uh, um, the, um, well, the dynamometers they donated, but also the um, spiro spirometers, which were a little over $100. The Pro 2 are a little expensive, but we're going to ask for those back. Actually, I need to send more shipping labels so you get them back so we can recalibrate them, get them ready, sterilize them, whatever needs to be done to get them ready for the next study. So it was an inexpensive study, particularly since I paid Maddie nothing. And she did all the work <laughs> and uh, yeah. So, um, but I think the, the next study will be a bigger deal. We'll need to have a, a, co a study coordinator who's going to take, um, control, take um, ownership of the study. Uh, so I, I will need funding for that, but you know, it's amazing um, how much we can do remotely. That's the other beauty of this study that it's cheap. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So if there are no questions, <laughs> thank you, Cami. <laughs> I have one other thing, Dr. Kimonas. Going back to what Allison was saying about um, having the issues with sitting up and breathing and doing, holding the devices, I'm not sure if you have got your email yet, um, but I sent you an email because that's the issue that I was having. Um, on the if on the information that I had received, my MIP went down on the result, but my PFTs with the doctor, th everything went up. 
So there was the difference in the correlation there. And it's because I have positional breathing issues. And I think that's what we were kind of talking about on one of the happy hours that um, I think it's because I have to lean over on the desk to hold the device and hold my phone to try and start it. That, that's probably showing why the MIP went down on this study. But I sent you an email on that. We can talk about that further later if you need to. No, that, that'll be good. Yeah, Lisa, I'd love to see the data from the pulmonologists and, you know, what, what we can learn from it. Yeah. Thank you. I, I did consult um, Harrison Jones, who has done a lot of work on respiratory devices and looking at MIP and, and all the other parameters uh, when, when I did the study. Uh, and I tried to get him to suggest a different breathing exercise device, but he said, nope, that's the best one. So I'm sorry that you know, if, if people struggle with it. Um, well, I, I think it's awesome though, to, to do the best you can with what we have um, and see what we can gather. I, I think, you know, thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Dr. Kamunis. And um, I just wanted to like reiterate, like just kind of taking the feedback of, okay, maybe in, maybe the conclusion would be maybe people that don't have a strong breathing, their results might not show it, but you know, you'll be able, you'll have to see what Lisa's results really are, but yeah. um, just to kind of know the limitations yeah. based on the home environment. Right, one, one important thing though, um, to, to mention to you is that I wanted to do the study with power. So um, there are so many people who do studies that have no power. Uh, and, and so I consulted the statistician. I said, look, this is a rare disorder. I'm not sure how many people I'm gonna get. Um, and, and that's how she, she devised it, you know, having each person serve as their own control. It actually would have been better to have a longer baseline period but then I didn't want to lose people's interest. You know, I wanted, I wanted them to be engaged. So we tended, we had a, had a smaller baseline period, but we had a lot of measurements. So that ironed out the variability. And, and that's how we, we, we got the, the P of 0.02, you know, with just nine patients. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, Maddie, you have to look at the data with just the VCP patients as well. Now that, you know, we, we know how to analyze the data better. Yeah, to see if just nine was sufficient. But and I did look at just specifically the MIP value today, nothing else, just the MIP value with just the BCP patients, and it was still statistically significant increase. That's terrific. Another quick thing to um, put in there too was we had all those fires in Canada, and all of that smoke blew into Minnesota. I don't know if it got into other states, but being an asthmatic and I'm one of what, seven or nine of the participants and it affected me quite a bit. So, you know, that has nothing to do with your study. That's just life, but it affected my results in your study. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. No, that's All right. Virginia, I know we're kind of on time, or it, um, but did you want to share? I know. Can I just take a, a couple of minutes just yep. to tell you about the next um, study that that I'm working with um, Karen Lindsay, who's a, a nutrition uh, professor here. She's actually uh, has an endowed chair, um, and um, so the reason why we're doing this. Oops, where is it? Why is this not moving? Okay, is the rationale is our animal study. So, you know, we made a mouse with R155H variant. Uh, and um, when, we, when we cross the heterozygote with the heterozygote, one in four become, come, come out as homozygotes. So the ones on the right are homozygotes. They have two uh, mutations and they're very small and they typically die by three weeks. So that's, 20, that's 21 days. Um, but if you feed them, if you feed the pregnant dams and continue the pups on a higher fat diet, they live. So you can see that they do die, but once they survive, they actually survive for many months. So the longest was about 16 months. And this result is so spectacular. There's nothing approaches this, you know, even the respiratory exercise study that we shared with you is nothing compared to what we're seeing in the mice. So this has to be converted 
to a patient trial. And when we asked the company, well, what is different about this chow? Um, it's, it's the amount of soybean oil that they produce. And then these are the actual specifics. So these are unsaturated oil and they're also saturated oils, but it's all soybean based oil. Uh, and then there was some increase of the amino acids. Uh, what I did then, I also, um, because oleic acid and linoleic acid and um, yeah, they, they were the most um, changed in the uh, formula. We actually treated the mice just with those individual fatty acids and it did not um, improve survival. The, the whole thing improved the survival. So then we also gave soybean oil, um, I think it was 12%, uh, 14%, uh, and that improved. If we gave them bigger uh, concentrations of fat in the diet, the mice actually couldn't survive better. So it seemed like there was a narrow window. So I do want to make that into a patient trial. And then we have submitted this proposal to the Samueli Institute, but it hasn't got funded as yet. But I've you know, proposed to, to Nathan that we could use some of the um, uh, cure funds that was provided for a trial that didn't happen. I was very sorry about that. Um, but, but the good thing is that we're, we're going to um, do other studies with it, and hopefully there will be um, a, a drug that, that works. So we're working on, on it in our lab, and I'm hoping that there'll be a future opportunity to share with you all the cool work we're doing in our lab right now with animals and cells. Uh, Virginia, did you try on the, on the heterozygotes? So the heterozygotes, um, you know, uh, our uh, phenotype is attenuated. The heterozygotes don't have much of a phenotype right now. And we, we looked at the, um, uh, the TDP43, the ubiquitin levels, LC3 levels. We did see a lot of difference, but I have to actually step on Alia and, and see if I can look at the final data on the heterozygotes. But for the homozygotes, it is really spectacular, the difference. Because what would be interesting is to treat the heterozygotes and see if they do not uh, have any manifestation ever. Uh, the hetero, the yeah, we already did that. We treated them for about a year, yeah. And we didn't see a big difference you know, between the high fat and just because the heterozygotes don't have a big, don't have much phenotype. You know, they're not that different from the wild type, yeah. It's mainly the pathology. The, the, the mouse has changed over time. And uh, so that's why we are now working in our lab with Paul Taylor's mice, the A232 mice. So we need another mouse, but you know, just making a knock-in. Um, already the R155C knock-in was published by Dr. Clemens, he's in Germany, and he showed that that mouse did not have a phenotype. They did not study the homozygotes because they didn't produce any. So we know that that mutation appears to be more severe. Whereas in our lab, when we did the homos, we did get some mice, they didn't survive very long. But when you fed the pregnant dams and the pups with this higher fat diet, so instead of the normal 6% fat in the diet, you feed them 9%, they're living for, eight, for 16 months or more. You know, And you can test them. And some of them are actually stronger than the heterozygotes, believe it or not just because you're changing the diet. Mm. It's, it's, it's something that we need to study more, that whole mechanism in the lab further. Yeah, I would, I would like to know if it's motor neurons or muscles uh, differentiated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we haven't studied that in cells. We, we probably should. We have to figure out how to do that. Oh, maybe not in cells, but on the, on the, on the mouse, if you could... Um, when you sacrifice the mice, if you could see the, oh, yeah. the, the neurons and the muscles and see where it really acts on the motor neurons or on the muscles. Publish that. We, we see differences, yeah. Mm -hmm. with, with the diet. The high fat diet, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. yeah I'll, I'll, share, I'll share those, um, those papers with you. Yeah. So anyway, the specific aims for this proposed study is that we will look to see, uh, and it's just gonna be a pilot to see whether people tolerate this um, diet. So it's going to be, um, we're not sure exactly yet whether it's going to be the actual oil or you, you can make oil into a powder that you can then mix into a, um, 
uh, a smoothie, um, and then we're going to have a placebo versus the actual oil and, and do that. But for the pilot, just for tolerability, we're just going to try the oil uh, and see whether, you know, how people do. Uh, and then it'll be a, a bigger study thereafter. Um, so Neuronext, um, NIH, they, they have these clinical trials. Uh, there are 30, sorry, R03 and R21 mechanisms like three times a year. So I'm hoping by the, the fall that we'll have some pilot data. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that some of you will participate. We want to do a trial about eight weeks in six people and I'm hoping we'll, we'll get some volunteers for that. Uh, so these are the, you don't have to read it, but you know, these are the inclusion, the exclusion criteria, which I can share with you. This is gonna be the schedule of assessments. So over the um, six, so this was not for the pilot, this was for the actual study, you know, um, but the pilot we were gonna propose was for eight weeks. So we're gonna look at these various things, um, maybe not so much for the pilot. And then, yeah, the primary outcomes will be compliance, acceptability, tolerability. And then we're going to look at the secondary outcomes, pretty much like what we shared with you. And of course, the, the blood, blood markers, because it is a fat that we're going to give you. So we're going to look at those values. And then um, there is this ASA, um, uh, ASA 24 tool, which some of you have participated in. Um, so we have looked at that as well. And um, we do need more people to be doing that ASA 24, ASA 24. So, so that's it. I mean, that was all I had to present and to definitely acknowledge the patients without whom we wouldn't be where we, where, where we are. And then all my research collaborators, um, uh, clinical coordinators, funding, of course, it's really important. So that's it. Thank you. Amy, you had a question? For Virginia. So when you have these mouse models, I, I understand that you use the one gene mutation. Are you going to only uh, recruit um, people with that same gene mutation or are you going to use other variants? Yeah, other variants. Yeah, all everybody, you know. So yeah, because it's a rare disease, we can't be picky. Um, so we, we just take whoever can, can participate. And the more, the better, always the more, the better, you know. Um, I was very happy that uh, people who participated in this exercise study were still allowed to participate in the nationwide study. So thanks um, to Lin Lindsay for, um, for letting us do that. Um, and I, I think overall, it didn't really change that much. Because as, as you saw, most of our other parameters other than the MIP didn't really change, you know, which we didn't expect anyway. Any okay. Other any other questions? Any thoughts from anybody? Thank you, Amy. Thank you, and yeah, thanks to all our patients for for really um, you know helping us out and and being so lovely to work with. And I know we had some just join late. I don't know if. Um, time confusion or, or what, but uh, this will be recorded. We'll put it up on uh, the YouTube channel um, late late this week or early next week. So um, again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bonus. Thank you, Maddie. Congratulations on your graduation. Um, and good luck with your next program that you go through. Are you staying at FBI or are you going somewhere else? I don't know yet. I'll be applying to programs in the fall. UCI is definitely at the top of my list, so we'll see. Fingers crossed. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you again, everybody, for participating um, today. Again, patient conference, the other studies that are going on. Um, you know, we need everybody's participation. We need help with family members, getting them in the registry. Numbers are critical. Numbers are important. So... Uh, I think when we talked to Virginia about this <laughs> four years ago, we hoped to be at 100. We're still at 90-something in the patient registry. So don't forget to check the follow-up, too. So, All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.